it feels like every year in Australia, we're facing a barrage of extreme weather events from droughts to bushfires to floods. Even this week, there are heat wave warnings across the mainland and predictions are for a hot summer across the country. The backdrop to all of these events is climate change, the steady heating of the atmosphere, which continues year on year. Well, this all sounds bad enough for us humans, even from our air conditioned houses and offices, but won't somebody think of the numbats? My guest today is thinking about what all of this means for numbats, as well as for all of the other species of wildlife that AWC is trying to protect. AWC senior ecologist, Dr. Jennifer Pearson, works on AWC's national science team, applying cutting edge research from genetics and population ecology to on-ground conservation programs being rolled out by AWC. Recently, Dr. Pearson has been at Mount Gibson in the West Australian Wheatbelt region, launching a research project into numbats. And I started by asking her about this numbat work and the sort of data being collected by the team. Because it's really delving into the fine scale conditions and how animals may actually change their behavior in terms of these conditions. So for things like numbats, we know most of what uh, our knowledge is is from really small areas and during cooler conditions. And so to be able to understand the impacts of extremely hot conditions, we need to start doing more research during these hot conditions. So we've gone out and put these, you know, incredibly, you know, cool, you know, highly technical collars on them where we can measure their activity, where it's actually tracking them 25 times a second on five different axes. So we're seeing exactly what these numbats are doing through the day. And we're tracking that also with temperature and then looking at the shelters that they're using. These are quite small mammals, aren't they? And I guess one of the things that distinguishes numbats from other marsupials is that they're active during the day. Um, so, you know, I guess, does that put them at a heightened sensitivity to, to changes in climate? Well, interestingly, yes and no. I mean, more of the recent work coming out now is actually showing that high nighttime temperatures are a real risk to many species. And in Australia, a lot of our nocturnal species are really going to be impacted by, you know, our minimum temperatures being higher. So there's a not more or less risk during in terms of that diurnal versus no nocturnal. Um, but when it comes to numbats, one of the things that we can look at with that activity is how much they're gonna shift that in the morning and evening. So right now they come out during the day when it's pretty warm and they're really tracking the termites and how the termites are moving around the landscape because they need the termites to be really close to the surface to access them. So part of what we're looking at is trying to see how much they might shift that activity with those temperatures. Okay, interesting. So a behavioral response, which also comes into how vulnerable they might be. Um, I think I interrupted you when you were talking about the tracking devices. This is um, a refinement of the sorts of collars that we've used for tracking animals before and generating huge amounts of data. Does that mean you can answer different sorts of questions? It does. It allows us to answer uh, multiple questions with one collar, and that's what's so exciting about it. So we have a subset of collars that have GPS information as well. And with the accelerometer data, we'll look at basically how much they're moving around. The GPS will tell us where they are. We've got temperature sensors on their collars, and that's going to be able to allow us to match kind of, you know, where they're moving around the landscape. You can see here kind of when they get shelter, what are they experiencing compared to the outdoor temperatures? We also have a weather station set up in the area to compare the temperature they experience on their collar versus what's out there during the day. And then we also are... Are, have traditional VHF on there. So we're tracking these numbats to their shelters, both at night and during hot conditions, and seeing if they're using different types of shelters. So we've also deployed eye buttons into the shelters that actually tell us the temperature and the humidity of that shelter. So we're collecting you know, an extraordinary amount of information at a really fine scale to, to look at what happens when it's hot for numbats. And I believe during the time you were there in November, there was a heat wave actually unfolding. So it was, you know, really relevant to the research that, that you were getting underway. Yeah, it's, you know, one of those really interesting things, isn't it? We went out and the, the plan is to do this for about three months through the summer. And we wanted to start doing November and December to get more, you know, moderate, if you will, conditions as the baseline. And then we anticipated January potentially having heat waves where we could track the very hot conditions. And instead, we were out there during the week where we had, I think, you know, a record number of days above 40 for November. Um, 
So, you know, the very first numbats out there collared were running around getting heat wave data for us immediately. Um, and this mm -hmm. week continuing is over 35, which is what we're defining out there as, as times that are very hot for the numbats. Mm. Sounds tough for, for those small mammals, but this is the sort of information that will help us manage reintroduced populations like the one at Mount Gibson and at other sites. So a really fascinating project there. We might just zoom out a bit now and, and think a little about what does climate change mean for AWC's mission and approach? What, what kind of challenge does it pose? Climate change really fundamentally challenges how we do things. Um, and that's why it's such a, uh, a big threat to be able to look at and how it interacts with the other threatening processes that you mentioned we work on earlier. And so when we think about climate change, it really impacts you know, the species that we protect, it impacts where we protect them, and it impacts how we might protect them. And so we really have to think holistically about how we're going to integrate mitigating the impacts of climate change on AWC's uh, mission. Mm. Yeah, a fundamental challenge across all of the sites that we work and affecting so many of the, the wildlife species populations and also vegetation, I suppose. Um, but we know that the impacts won't be felt equally across those different sites or even between different species. Can you describe to us a little bit of the work you've been doing to work out which species are most vulnerable or most at risk and how we might prioritize the work that, that's needed? Sure, yeah. So what we've done this year is we've developed a, a bespoke vulnerability assessment for the species in AWC's translocation program initially. And then we can use this also and adapt it for threatened species generally that AWC is working to protect. And it's really using kind of the three tenets of looking at climate change vulnerability. And that's really looking at exposure or, you know, how much, you know, is climate change going to you know, be there for that species. So the rate and magnitude of changes in mean climate variables and extreme events. And then we look at sensitivity. So the impact of that change on the species or the system. And then finally, adaptive capacity, how that system might be able to respond to it. And we put those three things together and can use that to prioritize which species might be most, um, you know, highest in terms of at risk for climate change threats on AWC properties. But more importantly, we can also use those to direct which management actions are going to be most important for those species by linking that directly to, you know, the sensitivity and adaptive capacity aspects of that. Okay, so, so exposure is kind of how things will change, how we're expecting conditions to change. Sensitivity is how that might affect the animals, the populations. And adaptive potential is, that's where the hope is, isn't it? That we can actually either help populations be more adaptive or respond in a way that helps them survive or that they've got inherent you know properties that help them survive is that is that about right yeah that describes it really well so when we think about exposure it's kind of the classic maps we're used to seeing so you know right now the climate looks like this in the future the climate's going to look like that and that's really the exposure there mm -hmm. um, and sensitivity is really things like you know what kind of heat stress tolerance does an animal have how specialized is it in terms of habitat and then adaptive capacity, like you said, is really the hopeful bit. So taking advantage of those things we know about the species of the community, how can we facilitate it being resilient or adapting to that change? Mm. And there is a range of actions we might do. We might be able to, in the short term, add water points. And in the bigger term, we might think about, you know, facilitating evolutionary responses through, you know, genetic diversity, things like that. Okay. So, so not all is lost. Um, Let's talk about some examples. So there are a few species that you've been applying this vulnerability um, model to, to sort of assess whether whether they're particularly vulnerable or not. Can you talk us through the golden bandicoot and, and how you looked at its vulnerability with those measures? Sure. So the golden bandicoot is a species that um, occurs across quite a few AWC properties in the Northwest in the Kimberley. And we we're really interested in some recent work that showed golden bandicoots, um, the genetic diversity that remains for this species, the hotspot really was the Kimberley. And so in terms of thinking about things like adaptive capacity, we can see that there's a lot of adaptive capacity in the Kimberley. But when we looked at the exposure for golden bandicoots across this range, we can see here that this is also where it overlaps with having very high exposure. So when we look at these maps, we can see areas that are green are really staying within the historic climate envelope for golden bandicoot. So what we can think about is basically 
climate conditions that a bandicoot has experienced in the past, if those climate conditions are going to be there in the future, we think it's probably going to be stable and okay. Anywhere that's not green in those maps shows areas that are going to be changing outside that historic climate envelope, and it might be at risk for being impacted. And mm. so we were able to look at that and say, okay, we have a lot of properties that are at risk for the golden bandicoot. And then we went through and looked at how sensitive it might be and saw that in some ways, you know, reproductively, they can, you know, reproduce quite fast. They do have a bit of adaptation to that um, aridity. But really, that adaptive capacity was at risk because it was all held up in the Kimberley there where it was going to be exposed. Okay, so the, the only mainland populations of this species that survive off of the naturally occurring populations are in the Kimberley. But we've also carried out translocations of this species, even in the last 12 months. Um, how does managing those translocated populations as part of the, the national metapopulation help with that adaptive capacity for this species? One of the biggest, you know, climate change actions we were able to take is to capture some of that, you know, genetic diversity that was left in the Kimberley and put it in at New Haven, one of our sites. And that was really significant because other reintroduced populations of golden bandicoots have relied on animals from Barrow Island. And Barrow Island, um, you know, being a small island has much less genetic diversity and, and potentially than adaptive capacity than the animals in the Kimberley. And so it was a real move forward for us in terms of making sure that adaptive capacity, that diversity that's left was, you know, some of that's captured from the Kimberley and put somewhere else where we can, you know, make sure that, you know, it's it less at risk there and spread that risk across the country as well. And then as that population grows, we also have the ability to start moving that around to other sites as well. And so really it's kind of safeguarding that adaptive capacity, giving it a lot of potential to adapt to a new arid site, but also potentially other source populations in the future. Mm. What are some of the other species that you've looked at as we develop this vulnerability assessment framework? Right now we're testing on, on five different species. So we've got um, the numbat, the golden bandicoot, northern quoll, um, I believe greater stick nest rat, and um, I think red tail fascagales is, is one of the other ones we're looking at. So we've tried to look at a range of species that have kind of different approaches to mating, you know, different habitat requirements, and to see, you know, are we seeing different patterns with different types of species? Hmm. You mentioned some of the interventions might be providing water points within our, uh, our safe havens where we've got these reintroduced mammal populations. Are there other sort of, you know, practical on ground interventions? Um, you know, I'm thinking of sort of augmenting habitat with extra shelter sites. Is that the kind of thing that would be considered as well? Yeah, that's one of the primary actions um, that we look at actually. and and. Part of the integration of the research, and particularly thinking back to the NUMBAT research, is really trying to understand what's needed for a shelter. And so, you know, a species like the northern quoll, there's been a lot of research on attributes of shelters, and that really helps us when we're making climate change plans to understand, you know, a shelter is not a shelter, it's not a shelter. So we need to understand what are the, you know, temperature and humidity properties of what they need to protect them. Um, and then we can also look at kind of prioritizing areas that are important in terms of you know, protecting, you know, if they need certain areas to have successful recruitment to the population, um, that we might prioritize our other threat management. So climate change really interacts with all the other things that, that we're doing. It's going to impact, you know, how the threat management works, but it also is really benefited by, you know, the threat management we do. Mm. So when areas, you know, have less threats, they'll be more resilient to these types of changes. So we can prioritize, you know, use these kind of two things together to look at where should we do, you know, the land management for these different species. Is, is this a tool that could also be applied for threatened species that we, we haven't got in fenced reserves that haven't been reintroduced, but that are, you know, extant in the landscape at sanctuaries? Um, how, might, how might it be used in that way? It'll be used very similarly. We'll just change some of the things we're looking at. So for example, you know, something like dispersal is considered really important in terms of, you know, how a species, how sensitive a species is and how it might adapt. And in fence reserves, you know, dispersal is, you know, reliant on us moving them around. And that's that meta population management we're talking about. But for species outside fences, we'll be looking at that kind of natural connectivity. And, and particularly in terms of, you know, if, if where a species can live is shifting in the landscape, and making sure that we're, you know, managing those corridors well and, and facilitating that movement is one of the main actions we can do. So 
all the principles are the same. We just will tweak some of the things that we're looking at that apply differently to being within a fence versus outside of a fence. Hmm. Sounds like a really powerful tool uh, to be able to do that kind of analysis and, and give species the best hope at persisting and, and hopefully thriving. Is this something that we will publish or we, we plan to share with other organisations as a, a management tool? Uh, definitely. We've been working with so many collaborators along the way. So, you know, as with anything, you know, nothing is done in isolation. So, um, you know, with the Numbat project, we're working with Catherine Mosby and Michael Kearney from UNSW and University of Melbourne. And that work um, will probably lead to several publications. Um, and we're working with uh, Cyro on a few analyses in terms of the climate exposure and drought impacts. And we've really been assisted, you know, quite a bit from the Climate Extremes Hub with Cyro in terms of all of the exposure work we're doing. Um, so there's all sorts of things in the works in terms of how we'll be able to communicate um, some of what we've learned and, and what we're collaborating on others with. Hmm. Fantastic. It can be a, a sort of overwhelming uh, concept thinking about climate change and how it will affect you know, the natural world. We're, we're seeing impacts of that already. Is this something that you think in Australia we've put enough thought into? You know, I think Australia is really good about, you know, about, you know, punching above their weight in terms of science generally. So I would say, you know, Australia is a a really great place to be thinking about these things, particularly because of the boom and bust systems here already. So I think Australia has put a lot of thought into how things vary over time in relation to climate. Um, and so we have a lot of experience in that realm. I think one of the big things that's going to be different is the frequency of those and it, what those impacts are. And so when species and communities don't have time to recover in between those, then there's going to be more shifts. And again, Australia has done a lot of work in terms of, you know, community shifts and community thinking. And one of the other great things about Australia, I think, is the willingness to take risks in the space of trying things. And so in order to, you know, I think make change in this space, we have to be bold and we have to take risks and we have to try big new things. And I think, you know, AWC is great at that and Australia is great at that. So we do have reason for hope in that space, I think. That I was going to finish just by asking if you think, you know, there is space for optimism in this work. Um, certainly in the work that AWC is doing, I can see how, uh, you know, we'll be helping populations to persist of, of some of these threatened mammals. Big picture, do you think we can have wild, healthy landscapes in the long term, um, considering the, the overarching threat of climate change? I think so. I mean, I think it's it's one of those things about, you know, what those look like might be a little different than what we're used to them looking like. And I think, you know, we have to, like I said, be very bold in what we're willing to try and we have to be open to how things might transform. And I think if we do those two things, then there's quite a bit of hope in that space to um, save so much of the unique wildlife that we have here. <laughs>